Good morning to our viewers in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Germany. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Café Pause. Each week we have the opportunity to check in with a Berlin-based journalist to, to talk about the emerging stories that are shaping the headlines in Germany and in Europe. And today I am absolutely delighted to welcome back Andreas Klut. He's a columnist with Bloomberg Opinion and previously served as editor-in-chief of Handelsblatt Global and was a writer for The Economist. Hello, Andreas, and welcome back to the Café Pause. Hello, Steve. It is always great to talk to you, and it's um, actually pretty amazing to me that um, so much has changed since our very first Café Pause of the year in January, which is the last time that we talked. So we have a lot to discuss today, but I think the, the big story coming off of this weekend is the runoff election in France. Uh, as our viewers probably all know, yesterday Emmanuel Macron secured a second term as French president. He's broken the single term spell that plagued his predecessors, Francois Hollande and Nicolas Sarkozy. Uh, many people of course had predicted his win but Macron actually beat Le Pen with a somewhat higher margin than expected. And this has boosted his party's prospects for securing a majority or at least a workable coalition in June's parliamentary election. In terms of the numbers, Macron won just over 58% of the vote, while Marine Le Pen won just over 41% of the vote. Still, I'd say like in 2017, France dodged a bullet. Andreas, I'm sure you were watching um, the election and, and the mood in the run up to the election in France. Do you think that people were actually voting for Macron or were they voting against Le Pen? I think they were voting against Le Pen. Uh, I would have thought that even if Macron hadn't mentioned that himself, but he essentially conceded that in his very different um, acceptance speech last night compared to the previous term. Um, you've frozen a little bit. Are you still there? Can you hear me? I'm still here. I can hear you. Um, okay, because your picture has frozen, but that, but I, I, you probably noticed a very different tone from the Jupiterian, um, uh, you know, and single grand man striding to the Louvre last time to this time coming with his wife and a group of children and being among the people and then very graciously and humbly almost saying, I'm now, don't boo, he told the audience, don't boo Le Pen, don't, because I'm now the French, the, the president of all French people. And he said, yeah, I, I know many of you voted against right wing, the, the far right. And um, so in that sense, he's right. And abstentions were, uh, quite a large percentage, um, but it's better than nothing. And um, if if you want me to, my, my take on it in, in recent weeks. So yesterday we had two interesting elections in Europe of which the French was far more important. And then a few weeks earlier, we had the Hungarian election. And in the Hungarian election, a right wing populist Putin crony named Viktor Orban won again in part by very cynically twisting the narrative of, of, of Putin's war against a war of aggression against Ukraine to suit his own purposes. And I'm amazed that he got away with it, but even a united opposition couldn't unseat him. That was, that made me pessimistic. But then last night made me optimistic that in these much more serious times than when we last spoke, that the, the populist tide may be sort of be broken because it, it was at least damned for the time being in France, but it was also, it appears, broken in Slovenia, formerly part of Yugoslavia, where a sort of mini Trump and mini Orban Jansa was, in, it, there's coalition negotiations that have to happen now, but seems to have been ousted. He, he, he bought into Trump's big lie and congratulated Trump and, and, that sort of thing, and he was best buds with, with Orban. So I think I think Western Europe seems to, or Europe seems to have, for the time being, as said in most reasonable people, even people who don't like the rather arrogant Macron, 
that this is no time to play with fire. This is no time. This is a time to be responsible because we've got much bigger problems, no longer just a pandemic, but this, I almost want to say this mini Hitler uh, in the East. But but I guess, Andreas, I think it, it also points to something else, which you, you kind of touched on, um, which is sort of a, a disintegration of the center. Um, if one thinks about the first round of voting in France, um, it, it, basically the, the center left and center right parties that were sort of the main parties in French post-war politics were basically eliminated. And what we can see emerging in France is sort of three blocks, um, a hardline left, sort of a, a amorphous center gathered around Macron that's very hard to define, um, and then an extreme right of Marine Le Pen. Um, and so the question for French politics is, is what these cleavages mean for France, but, you know, of course, putting it in a broader European context as you are, um, what's happening to the center in, in Europe? Well, this is an, uh, a story that, that goes back years now. And it was actually my first column for Bloomberg is fragmentation as a phenomenon. It, it, to the extent of fragmentation in the Netherlands and Sweden, you, you, you name the country, you look, it depends on the electoral system, proportional representation and stuff. In, in France, we had, the, we had a two round presidential elections, but we're about to have another election for, for, for parliament there. And that'll bring that to the fore. You, you're right that the traditional centrist parties have all disintegrated. And essentially the way Macron rose to power is by inventing his own, but by, by running as a person and just inventing a sort of, you know, party with a label that suited him, which, which we weren't, we, we kept filling in with, trying to fill in with meaning. So you're right, he's going to try to reoccupy the center. If you look at, for example, Germany, I think um, you certainly have, if you look back at the last few decades, also seen fragmentation from, from essentially three parties in the Bonn Republic, mm -hmm. uh, which became four parties and is now essentially six parties or seven parties, in six blocks. Or, um, but the what you've seen since Putin's attack, which has changed the world in so many ways, accelerated is essentially a return to the center. I mean, the the extreme left is disintegrating for all sorts of very deserved reasons. The alternative for Germany, which is sort of the Le Pen or Orban wing of German politics is completely irrelevant at the moment because they have no, no way to comprehend uh, Putin, Russia, anything that, that they're out of the conversation. And it's, entirely the debate is entirely and i'm we're going to get to it i know within the center mm -hmm. and the social democrats and their past sins and because a lot of different it, it almost reminds people that there's a lot of there are a lot of nuances and shades of gray in the center they're not all boring the same as we used to think during the merkel eras they are distinguishable and uh, I, I happen to think that it's possible that the Greens and the Free Democrats, which are the two most popular parties for young voters, even though they're the smaller parties of the four centrist parties, but they're the two most popular among young, could between them decide, be kingmakers for the, for the time being. And so the, 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 in that sense, I feel uh, Putin has returned power to the center. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel that Macron's job, and I think he understands this, is now to do the same. And Draghi's job is to try to do the same. Draghi has also been quite good in Italy, yeah. which went off a few years ago into various loony directions on both yeah. sides. At one point, they had a government of populists from the left and the right. Uh, I think that's that's over for the time being, because once again, I think we all have understood that we were um, kids in the sandbox. That, that, no, we have real threats. And this is no time to mess around. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I think the, the um, obituaries of the center were premature and exaggerated. So hopefully the, the center is, is coming back um, in, in Europe. And, and hopefully that's something that we're seeing with Macron's um, victory in France. And I, I guess I have one or two more questions about, about Macron mm -hmm. and about France in a, in a European context before we, we switch to, to Germany. And, and I guess 
the first question is, particularly after um, Angela Merkel has has left uh, the the political stage in Europe, um, do you think that that this victory makes Macron the the strongest politician in in Europe? Certainly, his hope is that he can sort of fulfill um, the the Merkel shoes as being the go to politician. But I wonder if that's really, really the case. I don't know yet. I, I Last fall, I wrote an article saying that who's now that Merkel's gone, who will be the next leader of Europe? Certainly not von der Leyen, certainly not Charles Michel, none of these people. And, and Ma- not Macron either, because no one really trusts the French. Everyone thinks that he's like a little Charles de Gaulle and just for him, Europe is just a a sort of um, label or phrase to project French power. I think that's not entirely wrong, by the way. And in too many ways, he was always going in a slightly different direction and not entirely European direction or transatlantic European direction. And my money was at that time on Mario Draghi. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, he and Draghi, at least in some respects, European fiscal rules, for instance, um, jointly issued debt in the European Union. They're doing a tag team. Uh, now, it, the, the, I don't know if, if Europe, the European Union needs a leader of the sort that it, well, it's a moot point, but arguably had at some points in the Merkel era, but it, it may not have one or maybe multipolar. And in, in a way that, that is what the EU's problem is and that's what they have to sort out. But what they do have for, for, first, for the first time is a common enemy. I think only Viktor Orban now, and he, mm-hmm. arguably even the Austrians, sort of would deny that that's the right word for him. But now that the EU has a common enemy, maybe they can become united even without the leadership question so clear. Um, but I, Macron will certainly reach for the, uh, the position and uh, whether the others give it to him is a question. The other thing about Macron, because you know the, the famous German, Franco-German tandem, Macron was enthusiastically pro-German and pro-Europe, uh, certainly rhetorically, whereas Le Pen was entirely against both. So whew, huge sigh of relief. On the other hand, as you know, Macron had a difficult relationship with Merkel and is going to keep having a difficult relationship with Schultz because he's a man of grand gestures, grand oratory, grand visions, bold approaches is very French and both Merkel and Schultz who tries to be like Merkel are people of small steps, small gestures and people who come across as timid. And um, I, I think the Macron probably gonna be more popular with the junior coalition partners in Germany, the Greens and the Free Democrats in some respects. So it frust- Macron was very, very frustrated by Merkel because she didn't go for any of his grand proposals. I hope he doesn't end up being just as frustrated by the Schultz uh, administration. I mean, it's obviously, you know, with a with another five-year term ahead for Macron and, and Schultz being relatively new in his position, we'll have to see how the, how the Franco-German relationship unfolds. Of course, it's been... Um, a key engine for Europe, um, and certainly this is a, a, a better um, situation than if Le Pen had won. But as you say, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how the, the relationship will will unfold. Mm-hmm. So, Andreas, I mean, of course, the 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 other you know, Dawa Tima, the the other constant story at the moment is the the war in Ukraine, which continues to dominate headlines. Um, in many ways, it's it's crunch time for EU negotiations on another package of sanctions on Russia. Uh, Mm. Brussels is expected to present a proposal to national capitals as soon as today, but certainly early this week. This new package is supposed to include um, some form of ban on Russian oil imports and may also target more Russian banks by expelling them from the SWIFT international payment system. But I thought it was interesting in an interview with Divet today that the top EU diplomat, Josep Borrell, said that there still isn't enough support among EU member states for a complete embargo or for punitive tariffs on Russian oil and gas imports. All this to say, Olaf Scholz, the chancellor of Germany, seems to be in hot water when it comes to Ukraine. 
Now, Andreas, you had a, a big piece in mid-March about Scholz's major policy pivot at his speech in late February before the Bundestag, the Zeitenwende speech. And on, on Friday, you just published a piece about how he's waffling on providing military support to Ukraine um, and the kind of support that Ukraine needs in a timely manner. Can you talk a little bit about why Scholz is finding it so hard to deliver on the promises that he made? I think what you saw in that amazing, that historic Sunday in February, the last Sunday, I believe, in February, when he yeah, made the that 27th. Yeah. Where, which took me by surprise. Maybe, I don't know if you were surprised, but I immediately that day wrote my first take on it and I called it a German revolution. He didn't even clear it with all of his own cabinet and so forth. Um, basically, what he said then, he's, and I believe that he still is, would say the same thing exact this now, is that we were all wrong. We Germans were all wrong for many, many years, maybe decades. And the subtext was especially we social Democrats. Okay. And so we're, and I think your audience knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about. We're in a world of perpetual peace with everybody. We don't need an army. We're against war anyway. We just talk to people, and in particular, the Russians, because they're nice if you talk to them long enough. All of that was nonsense, and he said that. And people were like, ooh, okay. And he said, now we're going to rearm um, and so that we're, we can be good allies and deterrence matters, energy independence matters, and so forth. What happened next is, of course, that you can declare a, the German word was Zeitenwende, sea change, watershed, U-turn, uh, new era, whatever you want to uh, call it, you can declare it. And that's in many ways easier than, than executing it or conjugating it to the thousands of decisions that then immediately follow. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that for the junior partners in his coalition, the Free Democrats and the Greens, and to some extent, the opposition in the center, the Christian Democrats, his speech probably was easier to, I mean, they were the, the ones who were surprised that day, but they're like, yeah, yeah, it's true. And they've probably had an easier time running with that than the social Democrats of Olaf Scholz. Um, new uh, profile, very, very good, by Katrin Benhold in the New York Times over the weekend of, of Gerhard Schröder. I've sort of profiled Frank-Walter Steinmeier, a social democrat who was foreign minister, chancellor candidate, lots of them worked for Schroeder, uh, worked with Merkel, and how they were all, and, and all of them, Zygmunt Gabriel, and they were all Manuela Schwesig. So many social democratic careers and reputations were so bound up with that, that there's just a lot of baggage. I think that's part of it. I think another important part of it is the temperament of, as a, of Olaf Scholz, which, as I said, he's proudly in the past, humorously even, try, uh, presented himself as a, cop, as a knockoff of Angela Merkel in the sense that he doesn't make bold, rash gestures, but small analytical steps, okay? Uh, so where is the UK, the US right now, the, the U, uh, defense minister and... and uh, and, and Blinken of the US were just in Kiev, uh, are making bold gestures. Schultz is trying to keep them digestible. And in particular, he seems to be, Putin seems to have scared the bejesus out of him, whether it was during their personal conversations on the phone or the, the meeting they had, but of, of an escalation into World War III with the obvious, um, specter of nuclear war, of some sort of, and, and he is afraid, more afraid than the Greens and the Free Democrats of, um, sent, of, of the act of sending heavy weapons like Marda tanks being construed by the Russians as entering the war as a, as a party. And, and I, I think that's unreasonable, but we can, we can debate that. But, but that is now, as a result, uh, Schultz has has been essentially come across as waffling and not communicated clearly and specifically communicated less clearly than his own coalition members like Annalena Baerbock, for example. 
you know, as who's making an excellent uh, sort of foreign minister so far. They're all in very difficult positions. They don't want to jeopardize the coalition, but but they're not yet on the same page. And this in turn has sort of spoiled the, I think, genuine German revolution that happened at the end of February, where I think they have changed direction. But now if you change, uh, you know, like a, there's like a large an oil tanker pointing in a different direction. First of all, it takes a long time to, to, to point it in that direction. And then you need to have everyone understand where they're going and to, to go there. And then there's still the question of how fast to go in that direction. And that's what it's over. They, they, of course, Germany supports Ukraine. It's just, it's just they're, they're not the weakest link in the European Union. That is Orban in Hungary. And there's another weak link that is Austria, which is problematic. But the Germans are so large that if they weren't a weak link, they could, as usual, they could, you know, bring the others along or outspend them and out, you know, all of that. And this is why it's so problematic and why the Ukrainians are so, it's very emotional, understandably, for them. The Ukrainian ambassador is, 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 is a interesting profile in, in Germany, I mean, of himself, and he's just no holds barred. He very undiplomatic. That's the criticism, but I love it. I think if uh, given with the country he represents, what else? I mean, I've been doing the exact same thing. And so, the, um, and, and Zelensky, or it, it was said that Steinmeier wanted to join two other EU um, heads of state or, or leaders and visit Kiev. And, and Kiev let it be known that Steinmeier, the social democrat who, who was responsible for Nord Stream 2 and much else, wasn't really so wanted. So it's not, it's not so easy. And it's a, it's, a, it's a mess, frankly. And it's a pity because Germany has changed overnight, just not all of Germany at the same speed. And once again, it, the impression exists that the allies like the U.S. have to pressure Germany to go somewhere where it doesn't want to go. I think that's not entirely true. But it, if Schultz has any leadership bone in him, he must understand that he's got to get rid of this impression, ASAP. And if he doesn't want to send specific weapon, then let him at least explain that clearly. I have not even go to, we've had all these subplots, different versions of why, you know, like very German bureaucratic fine print of this. No, just give people the truth about your thinking. And, and uh, so he's not cutting a good figure now, but it's, he, he could turn it around. He could turn it around. And he's already turned things around a few times in the last few months. So, I mean, obviously, we'll have to to watch how this unfolds. But I guess, you know, certainly from from my vantage point here in New York, um, I'm I'm just puzzled as to why this is all being sort of postponed as opposed to being addressed more quickly. Um, I think all of us who are following the news from Ukraine know that um, the Ukrainians need military hardware as quickly as possible uh, in order to defend themselves from the Russian onslaught, but also in terms of the ability to even be more aggressive and, and push the Russians back. Um, and yet, you know, today's news that, that Olaf Scholz is, is set to speak before the Bundestag's defense committee on May 11th about the delivery of weapons seems like an incredible postponement, particularly given that he was invited by Anne-Marie Strack-Zimmermann of the FDP to speak with the committee as soon as this Wednesday. Right. Um, and so coming to, to your point, Andreas, about he needs to explain his position and figure out what the move is. And it seems to me that there's some urgency to this because of the situation in Ukraine. And yet this is getting postponed. It, you know, urgency. I thought of another column I wrote that got picked up quite a lot. It was just a purely emotional column about Azovstal. I said it'll be the remember the Alamo or remember Thermopylae of our mm -hmm. time. There are these people fighting for their lives and they have weeks, days, or probably hours to live. Talk about urgency. And this is you put your finger on it. You said you watching from New York, but you're such a Deutschland Kenner. That, that, that you know where I'm going is you were surprised why this is going so slowly. I wasn't surprised. I'm just disappointed. That's different. 
I'm not surprised at all because this is what the modern Germans do, what they are. They cannot go boldly or fast. They're, they're the experts. I think Merkel at one point said that the Americans do things fast and you know, they take out a regime somewhere. We, we, we have staying power, by which you meant we go in, we stay, we do it slowly. But they take, they've, they've got so used to doing things slowly. They've, every, every controversy I've, I've covered, they've, they've, it's been like this. But if you've just declared at Zeitenwind in a new era and you realize that this is different and it's, it is in some cases a matter of days or hours, then it must change. And so the disappointment, but not the surprise, the disappointment is that, that they can't, still can't get it together. And uh, at the moment that redounds to Schultz, it, I think the coalition partners and some members of the Social Democrats like Michael Roth, just to name drops, uh, would be have understood and would go faster. Okay, I mean, even at the mistake, and you know, it's, it's this we could start shouting at each other. Even at the mistake of making some small mistakes, do something fast rather than wait to get it perfect and when it's too late. That applies this equally to the um, awful questions of coal, oil, and then gas. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, uh, God knows where that's going to go. But there too, Germany is, of course, the, the weak, weak link. Do you think that this is having an impact on, on Schultz politically? Is he, is he losing ground um, through these delays, if you will? Um, I, 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 I read the polls uh, like Fossa. I, I enjoy Manfred Gülner's polls, but they, they're always time delayed. And, and right now things are moving so fast that the polls have never caught up. And what I've seen is that the, the two main parties, Social Democrats and Christian Democrats, that there's been no major movements. The Christian Democrats were briefly ahead it, since the war started. And I think they're now even again or slightly behind. But the, for polls personally, I think the, the ratings have gone down somewhat. But it's, I think it's, it seems to be in flux. I think there's no sharp drop, sharp rise. And I think that tells you that personally, I think the way Robert Habeck communicates has been excellent. That's a matter of taste because he tells you what he knows, what he doesn't know. What's, he's, he's clear even about what's not clear, which is part of communication. But he thinks genuinely, authentically out loud and you understand uh, and, and Schultz clearly hasn't been a good commuter in that way. So um, I, I, this, this is moving so fast. We have to see. I don't think it's hurt the. I don't think this, the the outcome of the election would be significantly different if it happened today. Um, uh, by the way, just as a footnote, um, I'm not sure. Part of it is that I'm not sure Friedrich Merz, the opposition leader, has cut a perfect figure. He's had some hiccups as well, and I'm certainly. Pretty sure that if the if Amin Lashit, if you remember that name from the yeah. ancient history, from the uh, were the chancellor with the Free Democrats and the Greens, that we'd be in exactly the same position. I don't think he's he's the same waffler. It's 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 not about um, uh, the, the the party uh, membership uh, primarily. I think it's just a flaw in the leadership culture of Germany. That's developed for many decades. Thinking, you know, in a sense, you know, if we think back about ancient history, if we think back about the polling numbers in, I guess, May of last year, when when Annalena Babok and the Greens were were flying high, um, had she managed to become chancellor, I think we might be in a very different place. Given, as you said as well, how outspoken she has been um, in her role as foreign minister. I, I we can only speculate, and it's yes. fun. It, it won't help her or anybody to, to, to speculate. But yes, you could see her as a sort of Queen Boudica of Germany. I mean, she she has consistently, by the way, if we look back at the um, rather, I'm not, not, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of the Greens, and don't mistake it for that, but she was treated somewhat unfairly as they all were. But she said very clearly, and about Habeck as well, things that are now just obvious to mm -hmm. like banal, about Nord Stream 2 being a bad idea, all these things she said last year during the campaign. She probably would have found her language sooner. Um, we can only speculate who she'd be in a coalition with. But, and, uh, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. We can only speculate about the, the what might have been, but I, I do think it's interesting how the two coalition partners, the Greens and the Free Democrats, 
are applying pressure on the chancellor um, and the social democrats to take action more rapidly. Um, and yet that still does not seem to be having as much of an impact. So we are seeing you know, some divisions within the traffic light coalition, within the Ampel Regierung, um, and undoubtedly that's making things even more challenging. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, new names like, um... Uh, you know, I mentioned Anton Hofreiter, who would have heard, you know, who he was you know, damaged goods and uh, Agnes Marie, what is it, Strachmann or something of the Free Democrats, cuts a, f- a very fine figure, you know. Uh, so new uh, personalities are, are, of course, rising. This is, we're getting a bit provincial, but I, I think in the end, Germany will do the right thing. That the problem with Germany, as you know, is always been in the oh it's actually it was a quote applied to the americans by winston churchill in the, that they will do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives right uh, or something like that but it's a painful debate it must come to a sort of resolution otherwise germany will be but germany is of course delivering lots of kit I mean, we, we both know that but it's not the relevant kit not in the, with the relevant communication not at the relevant scale yeah so, Andres, we've gotten a couple of, of viewer questions that I'd like to fold in here before turning to the, the Social Democrats and, and, and their legacy in a little bit more detail. Um, one of our viewers, of course, points out that, that energy supply um, has become an important political topic, that prices have been going up and that um, the, the, both the, the business community as well as individuals have been impacted by this. Um, it's obviously become a political issue, um, but to what degree is this sort of playing out in Germany's um, economic uh, situation or, or condition, if you will? What sort of an impact um, is this new energy conundrum having on German business? Well, business, you know, the IFU, if IFU Institute, the IFU index and stuff, they've, they've all, they, those indexes have dived because of course, war as such and the energy question, but the other questions as well of escalation and have of course damaged all the outlooks and that immediately people will probably invest less. So the, the economy is in danger, but it's not, that's not the case just in Germany. In Germany, the particular question of energy is so intense because the social democrats that we'll talk about have spent it but also others have spent so many decades deliberately making th- themselves so dependent on russian energy i there was a study by greenpeace that i read about in the Süddeutsche that i found interesting that actually because of the rise in prices as a result of this crisis and the we haven't yet uh, got out of coal oil and gas Germany will actually transfer more money just for oil and gas to Russia this year, this 2022, than ever before. So this is an irony is that while we're talking about what to do next, we're, we're sending the money over there. And it's just the question of which currency and, and where does it get trend. But um, so this, this will be, I think we all know, and Habeck is um, the one to, to, to manage these details, but we have to get out of this mess and we, have to move towards a total boycott. So I think the better term than embargo, in other words, we, the West, don't buy any kit from them. Of course, we've, we've decided coal. Why? Because that's easy. You can put the, the rocks on something else and drive it to places. Oil is harder, but you can still put it on tankers. And then gas is the really hard one because Germany doesn't have LNG, liquid liquefied natural gas terminals yet. That was part of the misguided old policy. You could have floating LNG terminals. They're talking about that, but it'll stay, still, still, still take some time. So it's still pipeline based. So if you turn that off, and this is where Schultz against comes in, economists in Germany said, yeah, this is going to hurt, but we can do it. And then Schultz lobbied by or having talked to industries like BASF, the chemicals industry, which I didn't know this, I'm not a, I'm not a expert in this field, but it, it relies very much on gas. So that parts of German industry, it, not all, you know, Luxembourg isn't in this position as a financial of Germany where uh, large industries like chemicals could 
Schultz used to claim a few weeks ago be forced to shut down, uh, which would and because they're part of food chains. You know, we, we had a semiconductor problem last fall, still not totally resolved, I think, in, in, in the world supply chains. We could introduce another one and weaken us. So that is an argument. But um, but the the thing is, we've all understood that the economic pain <laughs> is inevitable. It'll, it'll come anyway. And uh, either I'm, I'm just writing my next column about Finland and Sweden. I expect them to join NATO. Putin will escalate, and we don't want him to escalate that one particular way. So maybe he's going to turn the gas off on us anyway. So let's, I mean, we have to do it. It's one of the things that Ukraine demands that the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians demand. Germany has too long ignored them. I think we have to do it and then pay the price in, in every way, economic way. Yeah. I mean. And certainly when you listen to, to Annalena Babak um, and Robert Habeck, they have set some ambitious goals in terms of reducing Germany's dependence on Russian energy. But obviously this is something that can't happen overnight and, and takes, takes some time. Um, and another viewer um, is curious though, picking, picking up on this, um, whether Scholz's position hasn't been strengthened by the fact that Janet Yellen has been urging the EU to consider the global implications of a total ban on, on energy imports and concerns about the risk of inflation. These are things that came up at the World Bank and IMF meeting. Um, how do you think um, Scholz's position sort of fits into a broader global context? I think Scholz's position is too small. In a way, Janet Yellen has the bigger bullhorn globally than Scholz, I think. I mean, the rise in energy, the, the inflation um, debate is should be different in the US and here. They're, they're arguing about whether the two phenomena are the same, whether you have a wage price spiral here or not. And Draghi and Lagarde, uh, you know, will argue that Europe, you know, it has high, in, in German, the, the differentiation is between inflation and Teuerung. I don't know if you've heard that. Yeah. Just because something gets more expensive doesn't mean that there's a, a, a decrease in the value of money generally. That's a, one debate. But uh, uh, whereas I think in the U.S. that's further along. Uh, long story short, I, I think inflation is a huge issue. And now the euro is getting weaker uh, as you, and, and the dollar is stronger, which will make it even worse in in Europe, and I think you will, of course, have consumers in the euro era uh, area uh, adjust their expectations, also in their wage demands and in everything. And you have this and better, better. But but now I'm, I was going in the monetary direction, which is not up to Schultz. You you wanted to go back to Schultz. Uh, unfortunately, I think that this is beyond Schultz's brief and should not even influence him. He has to figure out how can he keep the lights on and the factories running in Germany, given the inevitable exit from Russian fossil fuels. Okay, and he must leave the I think overdue tightening to the European Central Bank, over which he, by German design in the 1990s, has absolutely no say. Fortunately, so in the the last few minutes that we have together, um, I'd, I'd like to come back to the Social Democrats and 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 back to some of the, the challenges that they face and, and pick up on a couple of themes that have come up um, during our conversation. I mean, of course, um, the, the Social Democrats um, are known for their Ostpolitik or their, their policy of, of reconciliation, if you will, with the East. Um, of Wandel durch Handel or change through trade and trying to establish stronger economic ties with the Soviet Union, with Russia. And of course, there have been some very important personalities in the Social Democratic Party who have personified that, beginning with Willy Brandt, but even more recently, we have the current federal president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who you talked about very briefly earlier and, and who you wrote a piece on earlier this month. And then of course, the former chancellor Gerhard Schröder, as you mentioned, Katrin Benhold of the New York Times had a, a big front page story about him over the weekend and about his ties to Russia. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, these, these gray eminences of 
German social democratic policy and what role they play today. The gray eminences led starting with Schroeder have caused so much harm and keep causing it by not coming clean and not accepting their role in what has been in fact a big lie for many years, just and ducking behind the excuse that it was consensus, consensus at least in their party, which is maybe all everyone they hung out with. On top of the gray, beside the gray eminences, people who get me up the tree just as much are these sort of second, third, and even fourth row of social democrats. People like Manuela Schwesig, uh, regional governor, who did something outrageous that we can get into, but it's but even like pretty obscure and unelectable, boring politicians like this Ralf Stegner, these are all people who spouted their Putin appeasement stuff all these years and now struggle to face up the truth that Schultz proclaimed that February, that, that Sunday in February when he said it's a new era. They, because it, it attacks their own assumptions, their own biographies, their own careers too much. And, um, and and this hurts me. And it it is very with I found very interesting because there are social democrats who have sussed this out and are therefore all the more I find them courageous. There was a group of social democratic historians that I've linked to in one of my columns. They said this very very honestly. They said we've been wrong all along, et cetera, et cetera, and they spelled it out again. And it was interesting mainly because it came from social democratic historians. But then they said, and what gives us special pain is that a lot of our party colleagues now in the, in the SPD, they suffer more from their from, from, from the suggestion that they might have been wrong than from the images from Bucha or from the Azovstal or from women getting raped and babies getting bombed and so forth. And so it, it is a little bit, if you're, if you're outside of these uh, mantra, SPD mantras, these, you know, faux pacifist, post-war German, everything they, you know, the, the, from the uh, anti-nuclear marches and the, if, if, if you're not, if you're viewing this from the outside, it's a bit hard to take because, because going forward and making bold decisions on the side of allies, we, which we all need to do, it starts with at least coming clean and just being honest and realizing we've got a reckoning to do and we've got to tell the truth. And and uh, if, if you look at, so, and if you look at people like Schröder, that's just that's just disgusting, if I may, you know, and, and I think he will be forced out of the party now, but he's almost too, I mean, if you cast a movie and I think this will one day become movies, all of this, he's almost, now typecast himself as 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 the you know the the, the corrupt old guy, but the younger ones like Schwesig, they haven't come clean as well, and that must happen. Otherwise, this party has a deserved problem and must pay the price. And it's interesting that among the center left, that the Greens are very much the ones pointing this out. I'm glad to see it. So I, I mean, I guess Andreas, you know, one question that I have for you is is whether you see. This, this reckoning that you think needs to happen taking place. And, and let me sort of attach that to, to something that we saw, I guess, at this point two weeks ago when um, Frank-Walter Steinmeier wanted to visit Kiev together with um, the heads of state of the Baltics and, and Poland. And um, Zelensky basically uninvited him and said, I don't want you to come to Kiev right now. And this created a huge uproar in the German press and a huge reaction of sort of why wouldn't um, Zelensky want Steinmeier to come, but not necessarily a recognition of how his career, um, and in, in a sense, some of the policies that were, were implemented and enforced while he was foreign minister, have contributed to the current moment, to the current situation. I, I think I, I would say the, the German public, the German, if at least as filtered through the German press, did shine a light on that. I think if, if you go to the Springer Press and, and so certain certain columnists um, and talk shows, they, they did point that out. I think yeah. the reaction of Steinmeier is this, 
you know, this this kind of waffling, this kind of in 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 my column, I said if he'd spoken English, he would have said mistakes were made. Yeah, well, we all did it. Well, it's true, but it, that's different than saying it clearly that it, it's not entirely clear who disinvited or or lost whose letter or invitation. But it doesn't matter. It was really the this this followed the very typical post-war German attempt gesture by the head of state Steinmeier. He invited the Ukrainian ambassador and he wanted to have a concert, which is so cultured in, 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 his, in his Palais Bellevue, and to have Russian and Ukrainians playing and performing side by side. And the Ukrainian ambassador said, sorry, that's I don't have time for that right now. You know, nice. Job. But that is so typical. That is still the old days. It's just talk, you know, um, and and I think they're hitting the wrong notes. OK, I, I, I think Steinmeier is way out of his depth. Uh, as a man, as a, he's not a leader anyway. He, otherwise, he would have become chancellor that that time he ran. But um, it, it, so so he's not going to be able to lead on this either. I think the the people that the the, the faces to watch are these these younger gener- uh, uh, politicians among the Greens and the Free Democrats. A few interesting ones uh, popping up now among the Christian Democrats as well, and maybe even a few will come out of the SPD eventually. So, I mean, I guess, you know, one thing that we've we've been hearing, you know, over and over again throughout this this crisis in Ukraine is um, we need to keep lines of communication open. Um, we need to keep the diplomatic um, avenues open. We need to keep talking. But it's clear that we also need to do more um, to support Ukraine. And that comes down to um, providing, you know, some of the military hardware that Ukraine needs, um, meeting the Ukrainians where they need to be met, and and pushing back um, against Putin. And and so I guess as as we wrap up here, um, obviously we can be watching some of the younger politicians and how they're maybe changing the direction of the discussion um, in Germany. Mm-hmm. But what do you expect from the current government? in terms of some concrete measures in the short term that it can actually fulfill um, its its promises on? Um, they're doing very, very German, in a very German way, getting making everything complicated by, for instance, supplying Marda tanks to Slovenia, so can, Slovenia can send its old Soviet-made tanks to Ukraine and so forth. I think eventually, Germany must coordinate, as they claim they they are, with the U.S. and give the Ukrainians what they need, recognizing that that is not the same as entering in war. And if Putin decides to interpret it as such, that is Putin's problem. And that this old sort of let's not provoke him thinking must be over to with with an asterisk. I think the Germans will come around. It'll just take some time, and that's unfortunate. But I actually think everything, the the surprise is, so Putin has failed in every way and knows that now. Mm -hmm. He's achieved the exact opposite of his aims in every respect. NATO will not be driven back. It'll enlarge. Uh, Ukraine is genuinely now a separate nation with its own identity and will always hate Russia and so forth. We were all surprised that Ukraine can defend itself, and therefore the enthusiasm is growing to help it help itself even more. So we're, I feel, in a sense, building towards a climax. This could become a frozen conflict, or Putin might decide that he really is losing. And when he decides he's losing, what will the man do? Mm -hmm. In what form will he freeze the conflict, and is he able to? Or will he escalate in a sort of like the uh, the, the cornered rat that, that he compares himself to, that I compared himself him to in one of my columns, and escalate so dramatically that we don't really want to know yeah. what what is it? And and essentially that is that is what Schultz is thinking about. But that's also what all the other allies are thinking about. And this is the test of our metal, and we have to. St- to contemplate it and talk about it honestly and 
and then find courage to to go forward. And I, I think it's completely up in the air uh, how that'll be. But I think that that kind of climax, because this is the new thing. If Putin had won by now, we wouldn't have that dilemma. Mm -hmm. The dilemma, in a sense, is Ukraine could probably defend itself if we gave them everything they needed. Yeah. But then what? What yeah. will Putin do? And how would right. we react then? And I think that that is the next step. I think those are, you know, those are obviously the the big questions. Um, you know, we're we're way past sort of a, a face saving exit for Putin, but what happens next? Um, how does this conflict end? Um, it does it, as you suggest, become another frozen conflict um, that is unresolved, or is there actually a, an end to this war? And what happens next? And then, you know, something that we've not even talked about. The whole question about who pays for the reconstruction of Ukraine, uh, and and how that unfolds as well. Um, yeah. So obviously, lots lots of issues um, still to be addressed. But Andreas, as ever, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to to talk with me today. Um, it's always great to talk with you, and I enjoy hearing your insights. Um, and so nochmals herzlichen Dank, many thanks. And I hope you stay well and, and I look forward to connecting with you again in a few months if, if you're willing to continue having of these. Of course, and thank you. And also congratulations again for your Bundesverdienstkreuz. Well deserved. But thank Many you thanks. For great chat. Many thanks. Thank you very much. And of course, thanks to our viewers for tuning in today. Um, it's always great to have all of you join us on, on Monday morning. Uh, good wishes to all and, and have a good week.